title of my sermon this morning is Fables and Fake History. Fables and Fake History. The Bible warns us to avoid fables and it talks about Jewish fables, old wives fables, just stories that are made up. And what I really want to emphasize this morning is the fact that when you study the Bible, one of the most important things that you can realize is that there's nothing new under the sun. Right. Look at what the Bible says here in verse 9. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said? See, this is new. It had been already of old time, which was before us. And so what I want to emphasize at the beginning here is that people are people. Human nature is human nature. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, four thousand years ago. People have always been basically the same. And if we were to go to other parts of the world and, and spend time in Africa or in Mexico or in Europe or Asia, you'll find that everywhere people are basically the same. Once you look past all of the outward differences and the clothing and the, the food and the language. And, you know, when you get down to it, people are struggling with the same things everywhere. They're dealing with the same things. They're going through the same patterns of life. Uh, if you would flip over to 1 Peter chapter 5. While you turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So the Bible tells us that there's no temptation that has taken us, but such as is common to man. And that could be written 2,000 years ago, and yet be just as true today. Even in 2017, there's no temptation taken us, but such as is common to man. Meaning that 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, people were going through the same temptations. The same sins were there of fornication, adultery, theft, murder, lying, stealing. It's all the same. And the mistake people make is when they think that we have to somehow understand the specifics of the culture in which the Bible was written or we have to understand that the Bible was written in a time when things were really different. The problem with that mentality is that they're trying to separate us from the Bible. See, the way we look at the Bible is that the Bible is relevant to us today. Amen. And that we can just take the Bible for what it says and apply it to our lives. Right. And when it says that there is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, we don't say, well, that was true of the Corinthians. But look at all the technology. We have new, no, no, it's the same temptations. We need to apply the Bible to our lives. But what these false teachers are trying to do when they try to tell us that we have to understand the culture and the history, they're trying to put a step between us and the Bible. They're trying to separate us from the Bible where the Bible becomes this distant book long ago in a land far, far away. And it's not really for us. It's for them, and we have to figure out a way to twist and adapt it to make it. No, it's already ready out of the box. Amen. It's out of the box. It's plug and play. You take the Bible, and you apply it to your life just as it is. That's one of the most important principles to understand when you're studying the Bible, is to just think about the fact that life back then was similar to life now. And people back then were similar to people now. Because human nature is human nature. Life is life. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Watch this. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So this is pretty similar to the verse that said, There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. When the devil is stalking about, seeking whom he may devour, the Bible says here, we're to resist him knowing that the same afflictions, the same trials and tribulations are accomplished in our brethren that are in the world. It's not just us, but other people are going through the same afflictions all over the world. But the God of all grace, 
who hath called you unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So all over the world, people are going through the same things we're going through. Throughout all time, people have gone through the same things that we go through. It's all common to man. So when we read the Bible, we can apply it directly to our lives. We don't have to put this step of separation of, well, you got to understand that things were different. No, they weren't different back then. They were generally the same. Somebody said, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because there are certain constants of human nature and life that are the same for everybody. <clears throat> Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible reads, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. <clears throat> so what the Bible's saying here is that we need to compare spiritual things with spiritual. That's how we study the Bible. So we take one Bible verse and we compare it with another. We take one chapter in the Bible and we compare it with another. But we don't take a chapter in the Bible and compare it to something written by man. You know, pull out the fables and the fake history books and the encyclopedia and compare the Bible to that. That's not a good way to study the Bible. A better way is to study the Bible comparing spiritual with spiritual, comparing scripture with scripture. But the natural man, who's the natural man? This is the unregenerate man. This is the unsaved man. This is the human being who's not been saved. He's not been born again. He's not been spiritually regenerated. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. So what he does is he looks at the clear teaching of scripture and he rejects it and thinks it's foolish. So he comes up with some other explanation where he compares the Bible to something carnal to try to change what the Bible says. You see, when people say, hey, we have to go back to the culture, we have to go back to the history to get the cultural context, that's a code word for, I don't want to receive what's being taught here. I don't want to receive this teaching, therefore... I am going to find a way to twist this by using something carnal instead of comparing spiritual with spiritual. That's a code word. And when it comes to going back and, and uh, looking at the culture, going back and we got to see the historical context and we've got to, you know, go back to the Hebrew and we got to go back to the Greek. These are all code words for, let me change what the Bible just said. Let me tell you why it doesn't mean what it comes right out and says. That's what it means. And these guys that go back to the Hebrew, they don't speak Hebrew, so they're not really even going back to the Hebrew. What they're doing is they're going to a commentary that is also lying and claiming to be going back to the Hebrew. They're like three steps away from the actual language. And it's the same with the Greek. They don't speak Greek. They don't speak a lick of Greek. Neither does the commentator. But it just becomes, well, the Greek says that. Really, they got that from a commentary. They didn't get that from their daily devotion in their Greek New Testament. They got that from a commentary. And when you use these type of tricks and sleight of hand, it's just a way to twist the Bible is all it is. And we've all heard it all our lives if we've been in church a long time. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 27, but the anointing, which is referring to the Holy Spirit, but the anointing which you've received of him abideth in you, and you need not, that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth, it is no lie. Even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. So the Bible tells us we don't need a man to teach us. That means that there's no doctrine that you can't learn by reading the Bible on your own. You don't need man to teach you. It's not like, hey, if we don't have the pastor, if we don't have the commentary, if we don't have the theologian, we're never going to figure this out. We need somebody to guide us. You know, the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I understand the Bible except some man should guide me? That's because he wasn't saved. He wasn't saved. He's an unsaved man. He says, how can I accept some man should guide me? But once you're saved, you've got the anointing of the Holy Spirit and you need not that any man teach you. Now, obviously, that's not saying that God doesn't have pastors and teachers there to teach us, but we don't need them. 
to learn something. We can, everything that I teach you Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, you could learn on your own. Now, we're still commanded to go to church. We're still commanded to assemble ourselves together. And teachers and preachers can speed up that process and help us learn more. But at the end of the day, there's nothing that you have to listen to me to learn. All of it is here in the Bible for you to find on your own. It's all there. Because the Holy Spirit can teach us all things. He'll guide us into all truth. Now, if that's really true, which I believe that from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, that we need not that any man teach us, then that tells me that there's no scripture where we have to know the culture in order to get the right interpretation, or we would have need for one to teach us. Because the Holy Spirit's not going to explain us the culture. The Holy Spirit's not going to give us a history lesson, right? The Holy Spirit's not going to take us back, supposedly, to the Greek or the Hebrew. The Holy Spirit is going to teach us using these words. So therefore, if we need not that any man teach us, and if that anointing is able to teach us all things, that means we're able to interpret the Bible without external sources from so-called history or culture. This is a key point. This is important to understand. This is why I think the best kind of Bible to get is not the study Bible or the reference Bible. When I buy a Bible, I try to buy the most stripped down Bible that I can. I try to find the one that just has the text. Just the text. I mean, the, the, the less frills, the better. The cheapest Bible is usually the best Bible. The one that just has the text of the Bible without all of man's commentary and wisdom mixed in. You know, we need that time alone with the Holy Spirit in our Bibles. And God has chosen preaching and preachers to teach us the Bible, to help us learn more. Not these dead as a doornail theologians in a cemetery somewhere, you know, sitting in their ivory tower, concocting cunningly devised fables and sliding sleight of men and, and craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You see, when you hear these sermons where they go back and talk about the culture and, and you got to know the history, usually they're always teaching the opposite of what a passage says or they're somehow teaching lies. Because if they were just teaching the truth, they would just teach the truth. They would just read the Bible and say, here's what it says, here's what it means, there it is, everybody see it, everybody got your Bible open, that's it. But no, 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 they're trying to fool you, they're using that to deceive. Usually the areas where they, where they deceive are areas that are not popular in society today. Like, for, for example, go to 1 Corinthians 14. This is one that I've heard many times in my life. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 14, the Bible uh, says that women are to keep silence in the church. And they'll say, well, you got to understand the culture. You got to understand the context. I mean, back then it was a patriarchal society and back then men were in authority and back then they had a different culture, but times change. No, they don't. Amen. They change for some people, but right's right and wrong's wrong. You know, Paul is writing about 2,000 years ago, but Peter writing around the same time brought up Sarah as an example of obeying her husband that example was 2,000 years old. Yeah. So he's bringing up an example from a couple thousand years ago. Well, then, you know what? Paul's teaching from a couple thousand years ago is still just as relevant today. Yeah. And so we don't need the... But here's what they'll say. Look at, look at the, first, just look at the clear teaching of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it's not permitted unto them to speak. But they're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, that's just pretty clear. See, a righteous preacher would just read that verse and just teach that for what it says. Here's what it says. Here's what it means. This is what God wants for us. That's why we're not going to have Joyce Meyer behind the pulpit. We're always going to have a man preaching 100% of the time. When I get sick, my wife doesn't fill in for me and <laughs> preach for me. She'd probably do a great job, but she's not going to fill in and preach for me. Men will preach, always. Amen. Men will teach. And so uh, men will even lead in prayer. I mean, men will do the speaking in God's house and the teaching and the preaching. But, you know, people can't handle this in 2017, so they got to find a way to twist it. So they say, well, according to the culture back then... 
In church, this is one that I heard, in church the men and the women used to sit on opposite sides of the building. So they have all the men over here and all the women over here in Bible times. And so when he says let them ask their husband at home, what he really doesn't want is them to get up in the middle of the service and walk over to their husband on the other side of the room and be like, honey, what's he talking about? You know, what? Oh, is that crazy? There's nothing about that in the Bible. But that's the kind of stuff they'll come up with just to find another way to interpret this, another way to understand it is, well, that's just because they're sitting separately. It's just too far. But now that they're sitting together, just... Anything goes. Say whatever. Put Joyce Meyer behind the pulpit. Whatever. But the right way to study the Bible, instead of appealing to some culture or history that is totally fake. Yeah. And by the way, whenever you hear these things in church, if you actually try to go look them up in real history books, they never really pan out. Right. You try to actually do research in the library, for example. You just go to the library, start pulling out books about ancient history. None of this stuff pans out. Right. Okay. But the right way to study the Bible is to actually compare Scripture with Scripture. So let's compare this Scripture with 1 Timothy chapter 2. Right? 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we can actually compare spiritual with spiritual. This is the right way to study the Bible. The wrong way is when we go outside the Bible and listen to all these fables and fake history. The right way is to compare spiritual with spiritual. It says in 1 Timothy 2.11, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now that couldn't be any clearer that the woman is not to teach the word of God. She's not to be an authority over the man. She is to learn in silence. She is to be in silence during the teaching and preaching of God's word in God's house. It's crystal clear, and these two scriptures, they fit together perfectly. There's no contradiction. They're in perfect harmony, but what it's not in harmony with is what some people want it to say. Right. They want it to say something else, but this is what it actually says. Mm -hmm. Go to Romans chapter 12. Here's one. You know, I'm just giving some examples of things that I've heard over the years, and we, we've all heard stuff like yeah. this, right, over the years. People trying to explain things away by going back to the culture and the history. This is one that I just heard this week. This one just blew me away. <clears throat> this preacher named Johnny Pope was preaching. Somebody sent me this video, and it was in some sermon where he's preaching all these lies and, and garbage about, you know, just being really soft on the sodomites and, and stuff like that. But in this scripture, he quotes this verse. Look at verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's a pretty clear scripture. And here's what he said. He said, you know what I've even heard some people say? I've even heard some people interpret this as... You know, you basically feed him and, and, and give him to drink. You do good on him so that God will curse him. Can you believe that that's what people think? And I'm thinking like, uh, that's what it says. <laughs> and then this is the next thing he says. Talk about ripping that verse out of context. <laughs> so he, he basically states the clear teaching of what the verse actually says and says, that's ripping it out of context. Okay. Let's actually see what the context is. How about the verse before it? <laughs> Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So that's pretty clear. When you get the context, it's talking about God taking vengeance on your enemies. If we love our enemies, do good unto them, feed them when they hunger, give them to drink when they're thirsty. It says all we're doing is just heaping coals of fire on their head. God will repay. God will take vengeance. That's what it actually says. Amen. But he said, oh, that's not what this means. Let me tell you what it really means. In the Jewish home, and right that when you hear that, you already know where this is going. In the Jewish home, at the center of the Jewish home, was a fireplace. 
And I'm thinking like, yeah, at the center of like 90% of homes for the history of mankind, there's a fireplace. Everybody's got a fireplace or a wood stove throughout history before HVAC units. He says, in the center of the Jewish home, there was a fireplace. And he said, actually, what this is saying is that sometimes when they didn't have any hot coals in the fireplace, they'd go to their neighbor's house to borrow hot coals and they carried them on their head. So they would go over to their neighbor's house with a big iron pot on their head and say, friend, may I borrow a cup of sugar and would you also put some live hot coals on my head? And he said they'd put two or three hot coals and then they'd cover it up with ashes and send you home. So when the Bible says you're going to heap coals of fire on it, it's saying you're bringing them warmth and love and compassion and, and all this. I mean, is that the craziest thing you've ever heard? I mean, come on. And first of all, it doesn't say you'll put two or three hot coals in their little basket. It says you'll heap. What's a heap? This is like when Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps. Yeah. With the jawbone of an ass have I slain a thousand men. But see, that's comparing scripture with scripture yeah. and actually understanding that a heap is a giant pile of something. Yeah. I mean, our friend from New Zealand, Sam, he knows what heaps are. <laughs> Anybody from Australia can tell you what heaps are. But it says you'll heap coals of fire on his head. It doesn't say you'll place a few gently in a... Who carries hot coals on their head? <laughs> You're going to burn your head. <laughs> iron is a conductor of heat. An iron pot on your head. But, but even if that weren't the craziest, most ridiculous thing I've ever heard about going over to your neighbor's house and borrowing hot coals and carrying them home on your head, and that that's what God's saying, is that if we actually read the context, it says that it's vengeance. He's going to repay them. But let's go further. Let, this is a good way to study the Bible. If we're studying the Bible, we should compare Scripture with Scripture. So when I read this Scripture and it says, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I'll repay, saith the Lord. That reminds me of another Scripture that says almost the same thing. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's flip over there. Hebrews chapter 10. So if we see a Scripture that's really, really similar to another Scripture, then we can compare the two and help us understand these scriptures. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Does that sound like a blessing? Getting a few hot coals to cook your breakfast? No, it's saying it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But let's go even further. Both of these scriptures have said, it is written, or it hath been said. So it's referring back to something in the Old Testament. Let's go back and find that source. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. See, whenever we're studying the New Testament, if it quotes the Old Testament, it's always a good idea to go back in your Old Testament and look up that quote. That's a good way to study the Bible right there, to, to compare spiritual things with spiritual. So go to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 35 and we'll find the source of the quote vengeance belongeth unto me I will recompense saith the Lord and again the Lord shall judge his people look at verse 35 this is what God says to me vengeance to me belongeth vengeance and recompense their foot shall slide in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Those are bad things. And then the next verse says, for the Lord shall judge his people. Proving that this is what's being quoted. Because in Hebrews 10 it said, and again the Lord shall judge his people. Proving that this is what's being quoted. So Deuteronomy 32 agrees. Hebrews 10 agrees. Romans 12 agrees. But Johnny Pope the watered-down, lame, false teacher, he doesn't agree, so he gets up and lies and deceives and changes what the Bible says. And he's a brazen liar. It's not an accident that he gets up and reads verse 20, doesn't tie it in with verse 19. Verse 20 starts with the word, therefore. That's a conjunction connecting it to what was just said in verse 19 about God taking vengeance. 
Instead, he just quotes the verse out of context purposely, and then because he knows subconsciously in his mind that that's what he's doing, that's why he says, yeah, talk about taking this verse out of context. Because taking the verse out of context is on his mind, and that's spilled out of his mouth, because that's what he's doing. Yeah. He took it out of context. He knows he took it out of context. He knows he's a liar. He knows he's a false teacher. And he just gets up and lies brazenly through his teeth in a sermon telling us, bring in the sodomites. Forgive all, uh, pedophiles. Bring in the child rapists. Br let them be restored. That's the garbage he was preaching in this sermon. And I mean, this is the kind of stuff that people will do to do what? To teach lies. And so when you hear this, oh, well, in the Jewish home, in the Jewish wedding, in the Jewish culture, if we understand the history, if we understand the cultural context, this is just a code word for, I'm going to twist the Bible and teach lies. And when you hear that, you better get on red alert. When you hear that, you better perk up and get on red alert. And look, if they're just quoting the verse, you better just turn there just to be safe when you hear that kind of stuff. Yeah. Say, I better turn there. But that's not what people are doing today. People are just, amen, amen. Oh, that's good. That's interesting. Wow, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that having keeps of uh, coals of fire heaped upon your head is a blessing. It's actually a blessing to have coals of fire heaped upon their head. See, this is so ridiculous because what he's telling people is, he's telling them, look, you don't have to avenge yourselves. Just do good unto people and then God will bless them more. And then it's just blessing upon blessing and blessing and good God, good sin and cold hell. Right? That's the teaching today in the fun centers of America that are passing themselves off as churches. They don't teach the truth. No, the true story is that when someone does something extremely wicked in our lives, or when we know of someone who does something very wicked, we're tempted to take things into our own hands, aren't we? Yeah. Sometimes we might get tempted to get physical or to get violent or something as human beings, right? We wouldn't be the first people who had done such a thing. When, when someone is molested or raped or murdered or robbed or vandalized, you know, it, it, it's easy sometimes to get in the flesh and to want to take things into our own hands and to wrestle against flesh and blood and to avenge ourselves. But he says, no, 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 avenge not yourselves because vengeance belongs to the Lord. He will repay. So this is how we can calm down in a situation like that. We can say, you know what? God's going to take care of that guy. God's going to take it. And we see that all throughout the Old Testament. Again, if we compare Scripture with Scripture, where men of God have an attitude that says, you know, I'm going to let the Lord take care of that. I'm going to let God take care of that. I'm not going to take that into my own hands. That's what the Bible is actually teaching. And you know what? That actually works. Because there have been times in my life when I got really angry and upset, and I think about these verses, and I say, you know what? God is going to punish the evildoers we put down the sword. It's not our job. Those that live by the sword will die by the sword. And we realize that vengeance belongs to the Lord. But we don't just have this attitude that says, no one should ever be punished. Let everyone be blessed. Let everyone have little happy hot coals on their head. It's not, talk about turning scripture on its head. Amen. Here's another example. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter, and I'm just going through some examples that I've heard, recent examples or examples that I've heard throughout my life of just how the culture is used to change what the Bible says. And we need to just realize that the only thing we know for sure is what's written in the Bible. Amen. So when someone tries to tell us about what life was like 2,000 years ago, the true story, if you've ever done any actual study in ancient history, which when I was a teenager, I loved ancient history. I, I got all kinds of books from the library and I really enjoyed reading up on the ancient Greeks and the ancient Roman Empire and the ancient Hittites and the Babylonians and the Sumerians and all these things. I thought it was fascinating. But what you'll realize is that when you study that subject, real study, not surfing the internet, but opening books and reading them, what you'll find is that we know very little about what went on back then. If you do real study, that's what you'll come up with. And if you talk to people that are really experts, they'll tell you, we know very little about what life was like back then because very little has survived. I mean, the, the, the biggest thing that survived, even from a secular standpoint, this is the most text that has survived of just good, solid, historical. I mean, the Bible is considered a valid historical document. 
even by worldly historians because they, they fact-checked it with things and, and found it to line up that the empires in this book actually existed and, and these things. You know, obviously most of the stories in the Bible you're not going to be able to verify with history because of the fact that God wants us to have faith in those things. He doesn't want us to be able to, to prove it all with an outside source. He wants us to believe his account and not go seeking after some other account. But different people that are the Hittites, there was a long time when people said, there's no such thing as the Hittites. The Bible made that up. That was what people thought for a long time until in the 20th century, they started to excavate and they found the Hittites. They even deciphered their ancient language and they found them to be a great world power at that time and that it was not uh, something that the Bible had invented. Now, you know, you try to fact check the Book of Mormon with any history, there's no Lamanites or Nemanites or whatever. So th the bottom line is that, you know, when you study history, ancient history, you'll find that before the time of Christ, there's very little to go on. It it's really hard to nail things down. Even some of the biggest historians, there are whole chapters missing from their books when you go to read their books. G giant chapters will be missing. You just say, this hasn't survived, this, this chapter. It's missing. So when you hear people tell you exactly what the way of life was 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, take it with a huge grain of salt. Let every red alert and red flag go up and look up and see if that's actually what the Bible's teaching because usually it's not. One of the things that's pretty common that you'll hear for twisting scripture, are you in 1 Corinthians 5? Is they'll teach this thing of the, the male shrine prostitutes or the, the shrine prostitution. And what they'll teach is, they'll teach that, well, it wasn't sodomites. And all the modern versions, they take out the word sodomite and they change it to that shrine situation. And they say, you know, well, you know, that's what was really going on. Who's ever heard that teaching in, in church about these, these cults and they'd go to the temple? And, uh, but here's the thing, you'll never find that mentioned in the Bible one time. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm mistaken, but I don't see this at all. And what they'll try to teach is that in Corinth, and I've heard this taught repeatedly, that in Corinth just sodomy abounded and in Corinth they've got all these shrine prostitution and pedophilia and just the worst type of imaginable filth going on was just normal in Corinth. And then they'll use that to twist scriptures in Corinthians that condemn the homos. But basically, what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, shows that that is not what Corinth was like. This den of iniquity that it's painted as, or, or that this was just known commonly. Because look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, 1. It's reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So let me ask you this. If Corinth was really just this horrific cesspool of iniquity where all this stuff was just considered normal and the sodomites were considered normal and these temple shrine prostitutes or whatever that the Bible doesn't even mention was commonplace, then let me ask you this. Why would they be scandalized by this fornication occurring in the church at Corinth? It, he said that's not even named among the Gentiles. Think about that. Doesn't that show right there? So forget the history book. Forget what some scholar or theologian told you. If you actually compare Scripture with Scripture and look at the Bible, you'll see that in Corinth, even the Gentiles in Corinth had a semblance of decency where they said, hey, this wouldn't even be named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now let me ask you this. In 2017 America, do you think that this could be said, well, it's not even so much as named in America that one would have his father. No, 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 it'd be a reality show. It'd be, it'd be, actually, it wouldn't even be a reality show because it's too normal. Nobody would even bat an eye. No one would even bat an eye if, if some man's uh, ex-wife or he divorced his wife or he widowed her or whatever and the son marries his dad's ex-wife or widow or whatever. Nobody would even care. No, they'd just say, well, whatever makes you happy. If you love each other. That's what they'd say in 2017 America. But you know why? Because in America today, anything goes. In America, the sodomites are out and proud. In America, all kinds of weird things are going on. And so that doesn't, wouldn't even seem that weird to them. 
But in Corinth, they were still scandalized by that. So if we actually study the Bible, we'll see that Corinth was not some horrific Sodom and Gomorrah. It was actually probably a little more conservative than what we're living in right now. Think about that. Because, because of the fact that Paul could not write this to the church at Tempe and say, hey, you've got this fornication going on. This isn't even named among the Gentiles. We'd write back and say, um, everything's named among the Gentiles here, buddy. You must have been gone for a while. Think about it, true or false? There's way worse things. That, and, and here's the thing. When you study the Bible itself and you look up scriptures like Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, where it lists all these horrific, disgusting sins of this nature, when it lists all that stuff, you know what it says when it mentions the sodomites? It says at the end, it says the people of the land have done all these things. He said they've done it all. Why? Because when you're accepting the sodomites, you, you're accepting everything at that point. Right. That's the last thing that anybody thinks is normal. And so when anybody starts accepting that, everything else is happening. You just take it to the bank. Everything in Leviticus 18 is happening in America right now. All of it. And everything in Leviticus 20 is happening in America right now. I promise you that. Because we're already to the point where the sodomites are openly exposed. So... Are you going to believe some theologian who just tells you, well, you know, in order to understand the book of 1 Corinthians, you got to understand the culture back then, that sodomy was just as natural as rain, and these prostitutes at the temple were just as natural as rain. No, they weren't, because they were more conservative than we are. I don't care what some history book said. That's what the Bible says, that this stuff wasn't even named among them at the time. Now, I'm not saying that they were all godly and righteous. I'm sure it was a sinful place, but it wasn't as bad as the Sunday school teacher would make it out to be. And let me say this as well, that when we study the Bible and we see that the Greeks at that time were super receptive to the gospel and that the Gentiles are receiving the gospel en masse and Paul is starting church after church after church after church, Let's think about the world that we live in today. If we were to go to the most wicked, ungodly places that accept sodomy and that accept incest and all these weird things, let me ask them, are those going to be the places that are most receptive to the gospel? So what would those places be in the world today that are the most licentious, the most promiscuous, the most accepting of, of these type of things? Where, where would they be? What? Tel Aviv, there we go. Yeah, Tel Aviv, Israel. Good answer. Ding, 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 ding. We have a winner. But what about also, how about Sweden? Right? Isn't Sweden the one that's always in the news for just the worst filth and sin? Iceland, Denmark, Sweden. Those are places that would come up when it comes to just teaching five-year-olds about uh, the worst kind of perversion and filth in schools and everything, the transgender. You know, that's going to be a place like that. Now, let me ask you this. Are Sweden, Denmark, and Iceland going to be great places to go soul winning? We're super receptive to the gospel, right? No way. And if we were to go to areas in our nation that are the most accepting of that kind of sin and filth, those are going to be the least receptive places to go soul winning. And when we go soul winning, and Brother Garrett, you know, you've traveled around Africa, and I've been to some of those places. You know, where were some of the most receptive places you've been soul winning? Malawi is number one. Where else? Okay, so let me ask you this. Is Malawi more or less moral than the United States? They're more moral. Okay, do they have a more loose attitude toward the sodomites? No, it's illegal there. So isn't it interesting that when we go to the places that are super wicked, they're less receptive. And when we go to the places that are nice people that are more moral, why? Because everyone that doeth truth cometh to the light. But those that do evil, many times they want to flee from the light and not be exposed. So the point is that when we're in a society that just says anything goes, that's an unreceptive place to preach the gospel. And when you're in a society that has a semblance of 
morality, people are more likely to hear the gospel in that type of situation. So if we see the fact that the Apostle Paul, all throughout Asia Minor and all throughout Achaia and Macedonia, is having success with preaching the gospel, then that tells me that it wasn't Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me ask you this. Did God send a bunch of preachers to Sodom and Gomorrah? And they had great success winning people to Christ? No. No. So that just goes to show you that you got to go with what the Bible says and realize that people are people, the same temptations the Corinthians went through, it's the same things we go through, and there's nothing new under the sun. Just like back then, there were certain societies that were more wicked than others. Today, there are societies that are more wicked than that. And look, there were parts of Greece that were super wicked and super sodomite, like the, the city of Sparta, which is why I can't understand how anyone would have a Christian school where their mascot is the Spartans when, they were, when that was a Sodom and Gomorrah, but the rest of Greece hated them because the rest of Greece wasn't that weird yet. It's, it is today pretty weird, but that's another sermon. Go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. What, you know, what's the point of the sermon this morning? What, what are you trying to get across to us, Pastor Anderson? What I'm trying to get across is that we need to read our Bibles and compare Scripture with Scripture, and what we don't need is somebody explaining to us how we have to understand the culture and the history, and we got to go sign up for Bible college to figure out what the Bible really said. No, what we really need to do is get in and read the book again. And if you read the book five times, 10 times, 15 times, you will know the Bible. We need to stop reading books about the Bible and start reading the Bible. And we don't need the culture and the history. That's just a code word for let me change the clear teaching of God's word. So, I, you know, if the Bible doesn't mention these shrines, I don't want to hear about them. You know, I want to know what the Bible teaches. See, the, the, the same things have always been going on. You know, today we have the abortion clinic. You say, oh, that's a new thing. No, because thousands of years ago, we had them offering their children to Molech. And it was the same thing as an abortion is today. So there's nothing new under the sun. There were sodomites then, there are sodomites now. There was abortion then, there's abortion now. Lust was then, lust was now. There, there, there's fornication then, fornication now. Adultery then, adultery now. Stealing then, stealing now. Righteous people then, righteous people now. The gospel then is the gospel now. Amen. It's life. Here's another one that I heard. Here's another example. This is from John MacArthur. We all know the story of the prodigal son, hopefully. If not, you can read Luke chapter 15. But in the story of the prodigal son, it says in Luke 15, 20, and he arose and came to his father... But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This is a pretty straightforward verse, right? Just a quick synopsis of the story. The son leaves home and wastes his whole inheritance on riotous living. When he's out of money, there's a famine in the land. Nobody's helping him. He decides he's going to go back to his dad and make things right with his dad. So the prodigal son returns, he's humble, he's going to come home and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against thee, and I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. But when he's a great way off, so he hasn't even reached the house yet, what does the Bible say in this verse? That his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So the dad does what? He just receives him right away before the son even apologizes, before the son even says anything, he's just ready to welcome him home because it's his son. He loves his son, right? He's just ready for him to come home. Pretty clear, right? And then the son says, I've sinned against heaven against thee. And he says, hey, let's kill the fatted calf. And they have a big party to rejoice about the son being there. The older brother gets upset and says, why are you rewarding him, basically, for going out and, and, and wasting his money? And the dad says, well, you know, basically, you're going to inherit everything now. But we're still happy that he's home. He's still going to live with us. He's still our son. He's not going to get the rewards. He's not going to get the inheritance. But we're glad he's home. Pretty straightforward, right? Let me read for you. Here, here's John MacArthur's take on this. Because you've got to understand the culture. You've got to understand the history. 
And by the way, this is just for preachers just to sound smart right. and to make people think, you need me. Right. You need me. You'll never understand this stuff without me giving you all the culture and the history and the background. That's what it's about. Here's John MacArthur's take on this. Can't he even respond in a righteous, honorable way? And then he did the unthinkable. He ran. Okay, this is all in light of that one verse we read, right? Luke 15, 20. He did the unthinkable. He ran. Middle Eastern noblemen don't run. It's just something you don't do. Because physically, you can't do it. There's an entire body of literature. So basically, you know, you want to know the proof? Oh, there's a whole body of literature. Here, let me walk you into a whole room full of books proving what I'm saying right now. This is what's called the mountain of evidence. When someone tells lies, they'll say, oh, there's just a mountain of evidence. Oh, there's just so much. There's a whole body of literature. It's a whole genre. I mean, it's right, between, it's right between paranormal teen romance and travel guides. There's a whole body of literature on why Middle Eastern men just don't run. <laughs> you know, you go to Barnes & Noble and you find the why Middle Eastern men don't run section. There's an entire body of literature, Jewish literature. Oh, well, that, he just upped the ante now. Things just got real now. Jewish literature. Written about the fact that you don't run if you're a man. They wore robes down to the ground. Oh, wow. And that was so that their legs were not seen. It was a shame to let your legs be seen. <laughs> right, that's why the Bible said for their pants to go down to their knee. Yeah. It didn't say to the ground. Show me where the Bible, see you can't find any of this in the Bible. Show me the Bible where it says, hey, you better wear clothes down to the ground, buddy, and no running. Don't let me catch you running. <laughs> now this, this particularly hurt my feelings because I love running. I was very offended. But the bottom line is, and I'm reading this all verbatim. You, but the bottom line in that culture was that if you ran, you had to pull it up. And to show your legs was shameful. In fact, literature says that even a priest, when he's offering sacrifice, cannot lift his robe off the ground to keep it out of the blood. There was one rabbi who condemned a man for lifting his robe above his knees while walking through thorns to keep it from getting caught. You just didn't run. You didn't run. First of all, because it wasn't dignified. You didn't run because you move in a graceful, stately manner. And you didn't run because it would be a shame if anybody saw your lower body. And if you pulled them up high enough and ran hard enough, they could see more than your legs. See, this is the stupidity that these guys didn't have pants on. The Bible says they wore britches. Doesn't matter how high your robe goes. Not that Jesus ever wore a robe except when he's in heaven, the king. But on this earth, he never wore a robe except when they made fun of him and put a robe on him. But he says, no, no, no. I mean, if you ran hard, they're going to see everything because you're in a dress, dude. That's what they're saying. This is what he's saying. It's like he doesn't believe in pants. Oh, oh, here we go. This word ran in the Greek. This word ran in the Greek is the word for sprinting in a race. Hey, buddy, that's what ran means in English, too. <laughs> he ran the hundred meters. So if you go to the Greek, ran means ran. <laughs> If you actually look this up in the Greek, you see that ran means sprinting. Well, sorry, sorry you didn't use the word jogging, because the word jogging was invented in the 1970s. The word jogging did not exist, even in the 50s, let alone 1611, let alone 2,000 years ago. Nike hadn't been invented yet. The word ran in the Greek huh, is the word for sprinting in a race. This man came out of his house and sprints down the middle of town. Now, where did the Bible mention middle of town? In the verse, the guy's just at his house and a guy, you know, his son's coming down the driveway and he runs to him or whatever. We don't know how far he is from the house. He's a great way off, but we don't know how far that is. We don't know if the guy lives in town. We don't know if he lives out of town. We have no, this is adding to the Bible. 
But no, he is sprinting down the middle of town toward his son. And the people in town in a Middle Eastern village would have been appalled. This indecent, shameful thing. The rabbi said a man shouldn't even jump for fear. Somebody might see your lower leg. So if you get scared, don't go, ah! 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 So what is he doing? He's running through town, bringing shame on himself, shame on himself, taking the abuse. This is selfless. This is self-emptying condescension. Why is he doing this? Because he wants, listen to this, to get the son before the son gets to the village. Because as soon as that son enters the village, he's going to be mocked and scorned and heaped upon with shame. You gotta, he's got to get to him first. And the father runs through the town, takes the shame to embrace the boy before he receives the shame. This is downright crazy behavior for a Jewish Middle Eastern nobleman. He embraced him, hugs the pig-scented rebel, and kissed him. Now in the Greek, we're not done going to the Greek, buddy. Now in the Greek, kissed him repeatedly. This isn't one kiss. In the Greek, it's like... He kissed him repeatedly. Customary to kiss him all over the head. Just kissed him all over the head. Okay, does one of my kids come? Isaac, you want to come up here so I can demonstrate this? I'm going to kiss you all over your head. No shame for the boy. The father has taken the shame. The father came out of his palatial home, came down, came to the village, sprinted through, took all the scorn and the shame, threw his arms around the boy, kissed him all over the head, and everybody knew he's received him fully as a son. All that from just that one verse. Okay, so now let's see what the Bible says. Because remember, according to him, you just don't run, folks. Right? I mean, in the, it was just the worst thing in their culture. Okay, let's see what the Bible says. Flip over to Luke 19. Luke 19, and we're not going to look at all of them because we don't have time, but let's just look at a sampling. Luke 19, 1, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see, who Jesus, who, see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature, and he ran before. So uh, this is another hundred meter dash. <laughs> he ran before and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him for he was to pass that way. No, nobody runs. Go to Mark 9. I'd love to read uh, John MacArthur's commentary on that verse. He's running. He's dodging obstacles. He's jumping over people. People are throwing things at him. I mean, just, just adding in all kinds of embellishment. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> All right, Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway, all the people, all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. Man, everybody's running in this verse. Look at verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked them and said, what are you doing running? Your skirt's too long. You're showing... No, he... It says, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou deaf and dumb spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 17. This is just a small sampling. Here's the rich young ruler. And by the way, the rich young ruler was a pretty prideful guy. That was the reason why he didn't get saved. And it says in Mark 10, 17, when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Turn to Acts chapter 3. We don't even have time to go to all the running in the Bible. There's a lot of running. One of the most common instances of running is people running to Jesus, running to hear him preach. Why? That's the transportation back then. You ran. There's no bicycle. 
There's no car. There's no motorcycle. Oh, they rode horses. No, they didn't ride horses. Horses are rich people's transportation. That's what, think about, and, and again, compare spiritual with spiritual. When you read about these battles in the Bible, how many footmen are there versus how many horsemen? When the army goes out, there's 10 times as many of them or more on feet as there are in a, in a horse or a chariot or something like that. Nowhere does Jesus say, saddle up, boys. We're going to the next village. Jesus only rides uh, an animal one time right before he's crucified when he rides in on an ass. So why didn't he just ride his horse? I mean, him and his disciples all had horses, right? They'd tie up the horses at the stable and, and walk into the saloon. <laughs> Wrong. That's not how people have lived throughout history. The vast majority of people have traveled on foot throughout history. They're walking, they're running. That's normal for every person. And the Bible says here in, in uh, of course, Peter and John. Remember Peter and John ran to the sepulcher when, when Jesus rose from the dead? Look at Acts 3.11. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch. That is called Solomon's greatly wondering. I mean, they're running at the temple. Okay, but you say, well, but these rabbis, they were really strict about it. You know, these are just, these people are bozos running around. The noblemen and the rabbis. Okay, we'll go to Act 7. In Act 7, this is all the, this is all the Sanhedrin, right? This is all of the, 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 the rabbis and the Jewish leaders and what they do to Stephen. Acts 7.57, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. So what's their instinct? When Stephen preaches something that they don't like, all these big wig rabbis and Sanhedrin guys with one accord, just immediately their, their instinct, their knee-jerk reaction is what? To just run. That wouldn't, if they've never done it before, they're not going to do that. See, when we do things just instantly, when we react, we go on autopilot and we do what's instinctive to us. And they start running toward him because they were used to running, obviously. They're running. Running, 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 running. I mean, I have a lot more. I'm not going to bore you with all, with all the running stories here, but Mark 6, they're running, 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 running. Okay. <laughs> Let's just go, I, I'm out of time, so let's just close in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. What I was going to bring up, though, is this thing about the, the camel through the eye of a needle. Yeah. You, know, you got to understand the culture. Yeah. I'll read it to you while you're turning to 1 Timothy 4. Some theorize that the needle Jesus was speaking of was the needle gate. Yeah. This is sort of like Watergate, needle gate, you know, when this gets exposed to be a fraud. Some theorize that the needle Jesus was speaking of was the needle gate, supposedly a low and narrow after-hours entrance found in the wall surrounding Jerusalem. It was purposely small for security reasons, and a camel could only go through it by stripping off any saddles or packs and crawling through on its knees. Now, there's truly nothing new under the sun. This is the TSA, friend. Right? You got to remove your coats, take off your shoes, take off your belt, and pass through the needle gate. It's like a metal detector for security purposes. So this, this is what I'm, I'm reading this online, right? It says, you know, you got to strip off any saddles or pack and, and, and crawl through on its knees. This is what it says at the end of the paragraph. The problem with this theory is that there's no evidence that such a gate ever existed. <laughs> Now, that's a little bit of a problem, isn't it? <laughs> Beyond that, what sane camel driver would go through such contortions when larger gates were easily accessible? <laughs> but you know what? They use this to teach a lying doctrine because he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. And so here's what they say. Well, you have to repent of all your sins. You know, you got to unload a lot of junk out of your life and get on your knees and go through the door. Whereas the Bible just says, I'm the door, if any man enter in by me, he shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We're saved by faith, not works, not cleaning up our life, not unsaddling our spiritual camel. And, you know, and you don't have to, you don't have to quit the, the physical camels either to be saved. And you don't have to unload the spiritual camel to be saved. 
All you have to do is believe on Jesus Christ to be saved. But they say, well, that's why it's hard to be saved because you have to unload all this stuff. I, no, no, no. It's, it's faith alone plus nothing minus nothing. Amen. Minus nothing. But, you know, they, uh, that's a theory that's out there. Problem is, there's no evidence that such a gate ever existed. Because it's a lie. Because it's a fable and a fraud. And then if we actually go to what the Bible says, what's the disciples' response when they hear it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved? They say, who then can be saved? And he says, with men, it's impossible. Now, if it was the needle gate, that's not impossible. Who then can be saved? Well, idiot, the guy who unloads his camel. <laughs> they said, who then can be saved? Because you're never going to put a literal camel through the eye of a needle. And so Jesus is using this crazy exaggeration to emphasize that by our own human efforts, salvation is impossible. It has to be a supernatural act of God. Because you cannot put a camel through the eye of a needle. And then other people say, well, the word camel here, it should actually be translated cable. Yes, you cable installers out there. You know, it's easier to put a cable through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. That's what I say, instead of a camel. But of course, this would, this would mean that the Bible is not inerrant. Because in the Greek, it says camel. You're, you're not going to believe this. If you go back to the Greek, camel says camel. Kamilos. Yeah. Because camel is a pretty old word. In fact, if you look up in Psalm 119, you know where it has the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, and the Gimel is where we get our word camel. Super ancient word, right? Camels have been around for a long time, and they've been called camels for thousands of years. And guess what? When Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, that's exactly what he meant. Right, yeah. and, and you didn't need any history lesson, you don't need any cultural lesson, you don't need any encyclopedia, you don't need a Greek Bible, you don't need a Hebrew Bible, you don't need a scholar or a theologian, it's just easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. A child could read that verse and understand it, a little child. Let's close on this, 1 Timothy 4 verse 7, but refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. We need to refuse this garbage. Just refuse fables. Reject them. 2 Timothy 4.4 4 says, They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Yep. Titus 1.14 says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. We don't need the fables. We don't need the fake history. This is what we need. Amen. But you need one more thing other than this. The Holy Spirit. you got to be saved. A lot of these guys aren't saved. That's why they teach lies. That's why they can't understand this, because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Their natural man just can't handle just the Bible for what it says, so they have to twist it and change it until bold-faced lies from the pulpit. We need to understand that we have everything that we need right here and right here. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit and for your guidance in our lives. I pray that every single one of us would study to show ourselves approved unto you, Lord, that we would spend time reading and studying the Bible so that we will not be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And when we hear false teachings like this, we'll just immediately know that they're false because we've been reading our Bibles. We already know about all the running in the Bible. We already know about the fact that coals of fire on your head is, is, a, is a, a, a vengeful punishment, Lord. Help us to know the Bible so that we can be steadfast and unmovable. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Down to it, people are struggling with the same things everywhere. They're dealing with the same things. They're going through the same patterns of life. Uh, if you would flip over to 1 Peter chapter 5. While you turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. So the Bible tells us that there's no temptation that has taken us, but such as is common to man. And that could be written 2,000 years ago, and yet be just as true today, even in 2000. 17, there's no temptation taken us, right. but such as is common to man. 
Meaning that 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years, people were going through the same temptations. The same sins were there of fornication, adultery, theft, murder, lying, stealing. It's all the same. And the mistake people make is when they think that we have to somehow understand the specifics of the culture in which the Bible was written or we have to understand that the Bible was written in a time when things were really different. The problem with that mentality back then, they were generally the same. Somebody said, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because there are certain constants of human nature and life that are the same for everybody. <clears throat> Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible reads, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. <clears throat> so what the Bible is saying here is that we need to compare spiritual things with spiritual. That's how we study the Bible. So we take one Bible verse, and we compare it with another. We take one chapter in the Bible, and we compare it with another. But we don't take a chapter in the Bible and compare it to something written by man. You know, pull out the fables and the fake history books and the encyclopedia and compare the Bible to that. That's not a good way to study the Bible. A better way is to study the Bible comparing spiritual with spiritual, comparing scripture with scripture. But the natural man, who's the natural man? This is the unregenerate man. This is the unsaved man. This is the human being who's not been saved. He's not been born again. He's not been spiritually regenerated. The natural man receiveth not the things that he is that they're trying to separate us from the Bible. See, the way we look at the Bible is that the Bible is relevant to us today. Amen. And that we can just take the Bible for what it says and apply it to our lives. And when it says that there is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, we don't say, well, that was true of the Corinthians, but look at all the technology. We have new, no, no, it's the same temptations. We need to apply the Bible to our lives. But what these false teachers are trying to do when they try to tell us that we have to understand the culture and the history, they're trying to put a step between us and the Bible. They're trying to separate us from the Bible where the Bible becomes this distant book long ago in a land far, far away. And it's not really for us. It's for them. And we have to figure out a way to twist and adapt it to make it. No, it's already ready out of the box. It's out of the box. It's plug and play. You take the Bible and you apply it to your life just as it is. That's one of the most important principles to understand when you're studying the Bible is to just think about the fact that life back then was similar to life now. And people back then were similar to people now because human nature is human nature. Life is life. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, Man, the title of my sermon this morning is Fables and Fake History. Fables and Fake History. The Bible warns us to avoid fables, and it talks about Jewish fables, old wives' fables, just stories that are made up. And what I really want to emphasize this morning is the fact that when you study the Bible, one of the most important things that you can realize is that there's nothing new under the sun. Right. Look at what the Bible says here in verse 9. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It had been already of old time, which was before us. And so what I want to emphasize at the beginning here is that people are people. Human nature is human nature. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, four thousand years ago. People have always been basically the same. And if we were to go to other parts of the world and, and spend time in Africa or in Mexico or in Europe or Asia, you'll find that everywhere people are basically the same. Once you look past all of the outward differences and the clothing and the, the food and the language. And, you know, when you get down, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Watch this. 
knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So this is pretty similar to the verse that said, there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. When the devil is stalking about, seeking whom he may devour, the Bible says here, we're to resist him knowing that the same afflictions, the same trials and tribulations are accomplished in our brethren that are in the world. It's not just us, but other people are going through the same afflictions all over the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called you unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So all over the world, people are going through the same things we're going through. Throughout all time, people have gone through the same things that we go through. It's all common to man. So when we read the Bible, we can apply it directly to our lives. We don't have to put this step of separation of, well, you got to understand that things were different. No, they weren't different.